Good evening, brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Tonight we are going to learn how to manage our time. Let us suppose, okay, there's this bank that credits your personal bank accounts with 86,400 dirhams every single morning. It's a free gift to one and all. But there's a condition. You can use the monies that are credited to your account any way you want, but any balance that is left in your account at the end of the day is not allowed to be carried forward to the next day. No, rather it is deleted wiped out. Think about it. How then would you use the monies that were given to you? You would make sure you used every single cent of it now, wouldn't you? Well, that bank is none other than the time bank. And every day, the time bank credits each and every one of us with 86,400 seconds. We can use our time any way we want, but the time bank does not allow us to carry forward any unutilized time of today onto tomorrow. No, rather it is deleted, wiped out. And neither does the time bank allow us to borrow today from tomorrow. <laughs> no overdraft facilities. Time. It just goes on and on, making no concessions for any man. And in today's so dynamic, so fast-paced a world, when there is so much that we all have to do, and yet a very fixed, a very static, only 86,400 seconds at our disposal, managing that time becomes a real challenge. Or rather, as Stephen Covey put it in his very famous book, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Stephen opines, it is not so much a challenge managing our time, rather managing ourselves. So tonight, let us try and learn how to manage ourselves more effectively so that we can more effectively manage time. And to help us with our study, we're going to go right back to the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. It instructs us, be careful how you live. Not as the unwise, but as the wise. 
making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Let us dissect this verse now, bit by bit, and draw the beautiful wisdom that is hidden inside it. First, the word says, be careful how you live. Suppose you were trying to reduce your monthly expenses because you wanted to save money. Logically, what is the first step you would do? Well, you would sit and you'd very systematically write down and then carefully look at your monthly expenses, right? In the same way, when we want to save time, this verse instructs us to first carefully look at our life and analyze our lifestyle. Going right back to the monthly budget. You know, when we analyze all our monthly expenses, we're able to identify all those problem areas where there seems to be wasteful expenditures, maybe excessive shopping, for an example. In the same way, when we carefully analyze our lifestyle, we are able to identify all those problems where there are time wasters. Maybe excessive time browsing the internet unnecessarily. Or maybe too much telephone. Or rather the universal problem, too much TV. When we carefully look and we analyze our lifestyle, we are able to plug in all these time wasters and that helps us save a lot of our time. Also, my dear friends, you know there is a big difference between working hard and working smart. Between working efficiently and working effectively. There's a story about two woodcutters, Crazy and Smarty were their names. Both of them earned their wages based on the number of trees that they chopped down. Now, Crazy wanted to earn the most from her time. So she huffed and she puffed and she kept swinging her ax relentlessly, cutting down one tree after another and another, nonstop, without taking a break. Smarty, on the other hand, seemed to be working half as hard. In fact, he even found the time to comfortably sit under a tree and relax. And amazingly, by the end of the day, it was Smarty who had cut down more trees than Crazy. So Crazy was a bit perplexed. And she asked Smarty, I saw you sitting under a tree relaxing while I worked nonstop without a break. How come you outperformed me? And Smarty smiled and said, did you not notice me sharpening my axe while I was sitting under that tree to, to relax? See, Crazy worked hard, but Smarty worked smart. Crazy worked efficiently, but Smarty worked effectively. And we too, sometimes, just like crazy, you know, we fall into these mindless routines of doing a certain thing in a certain way, and we keep on doing it over and over and over again without actually sitting back and looking 
if there is a more effective, smarter way in which the job could be done. And that could save us so much of our time, our effort, just like it did with Smarty. Let me give you a rather hilarious example about myself. You know, before I came here to Dubai, I used to live in a rather remote part of Navi, Mumbai. It was called the village of Copra. And there, if I wanted to pay my electricity bill, you know, I literally had to personally go all the way to the electricity office, stand patiently in this long snail queue, and only then was I able to pay off my dues. And that routine, it, it kind of just stuck and settled in my mind. Then when I came here to Dubai, you know, mindlessly, every month I would go all the way to the diva and to the Etisalad office to pay my bills. And that was such a foolish waste of my time, especially since we have online payments which is so much more an effective, smarter way of getting the job done. How about you? For an example, I've heard many parents say that they spend a lot of time driving their children back and forth from school and, and recreation activities and extra classes Maybe you just got to sit back and look if there is a more effective, smarter way in which this task could be dispensed with. Possibly you could join hands with other parents and look at the possibility of a carpool. That could save so much of your time and your effort. So the takeaway Look carefully at how you live and live effectively. Then the verse says, not as the unwise, but as the wise, making the most of every opportunity. You know, every minute, Every second, it's like a beautiful opportunity that God has given us to do something worthwhile. God has given everybody, everywhere, all over the world, the same amount of time, isn't it? 168 hours a week. And yet, I'm sure you would have noted, there are some who can do so much more with that same amount of time than others. Have you ever wondered why? It is because they're always pre-planning all their activities. And that way, they're always ready. They're always prepared to make the most of every time opportunity that comes along their way. Let me give you an example. It will help you better understand. Suppose you were driving, okay, to a new place for the very first time. Now, the wise thing for you to do would be to open up your roadmap and to carefully look and then to plan the shortest and the fastest route to your destination. All that thinking, all that careful pre-planning, it would help you save a lot of your driving time and your effort. The unwise thing for you to do would be to just plop into your driver's seat and drive along, trying to find your road the trial and error way. All that lack of planning could end up in a terrible waste of your time. In the same way, when we very carefully plan all the tasks that we want to accomplish, maybe 
in a day or a week or maybe even a month. And then we very carefully draft out the shortest and the fastest route to achieving them all. All that thinking, all that pre-planning, it will help you make the most of every time opportunity that comes your way. On the other hand, if you just drag yourself through the day, do your tasks as and when they happen to plop along your way, all that lack of planning could end up in a terrible waste of time. You know, I have a great passion to teach the Word of God. But honestly, trying to fit this passion around a rather hectic schedule at my workplace and my family, it can be quite a challenge. And the one thing that helps me pursue my passion is planning. By God's grace, His grace alone. You know, I'm actually able to pre-plan the topics for the teaching a good three to four months in advance. And all this pre-planning inspired by the Holy Spirit, you know, it's so much help to me because it actually allows me that much time to read, to prepare, and most importantly, to learn myself from one of the greatest teachers of the whole world, the Holy Spirit himself. Also, you know, because I've already planned on the topics that have to be taught, the teachings are constantly working somewhere in the back of my mind. So then, if I'm sitting in my taxi and I'm on my way to the office, I'm just not needlessly staring outside the window. No, I'm ruminating about the teaching. If I'm sitting in my favorite corner, sipping my cup of coffee, I'm praying about the teaching. When I walk the roads, I talk about the teaching. And when I sleep, sometimes, praise God, I dream inspirations for the teaching. You see, this way, all that pre-planning that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, it makes me make the most of every time opportunity that the Lord grants me to pursue my passion, teaching. Proverbs 21.5, it says, careful planning, it puts you ahead in the long run. But hurry and scurry, it puts you further behind. Finally, this verse ends with saying, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What is God's will for our lives? One day, a teacher of the law asks Jesus, of all the commandments, which are the most important? And Jesus said, this is what is important. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourselves. So then, if we were drawing up a plan for the day, bearing in mind what Jesus just told us, then the very first top priority activity for the day would be for us to spend time loving the Lord. The second, but with equal priority, would be for us to spend time loving others as ourselves. And only after 
these two top priorities, they have been set and they have been established in their places, then let all the other crazy activities come to choke and clutter up your plan for the day. Okay? Now, regarding your first priority, giving first place to God. I know we all struggle for time. I tell you, we are so busy a generation. But come to think of it, surely Jesus was busy too. Or probably even busier from all the lack of, of technology and facilities during his time. You know, tonight when I came here to teach, I came in the comfort of a chauffeur-driven, air-conditioned car. And that saved me so much of my time, so much of my, my effort. But Jesus, wherever he went, he went on foot, didn't he? And that must have taken him twice the amount of time and effort. Also, Jesus didn't have this mic, so he literally had to shout out loud if he wanted for the crowds to be able to hear him. And I think that must have really left Jesus so, so physically exhausted. I think Jesus went to bed every single night feeling really, really tired. Just like all of us here go to bed every single night feeling really, really tired. But no matter what his circumstances, Jesus always made it a point to get up very early in the morning so that he could first thing pray. Well before all the other crazy activities would come to choke and clutter up the plan for his day. And you will note, Jesus used his time on earth so effectively. In just that short span of three years in ministry, Jesus did so much. He preached the gospel. He trained his disciples. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He set the downtrodden free. He saved the whole world by dying on the cross. So much accomplished in just that short span of three years. It was made possible because of his close relationship with our Father. We too must learn to give first place to God. Please, try to start your day with daily mass. If that is not possible, start your day reading the word of God, spending time in personal prayer. You know, my dear friends, you will be amazed how beautifully your day, it will just flow by when you started first with God. You know, when I started working here in Dubai eight years ago, I was in for a root shock. There used to be so much work dumped on my desk and I had nobody to delegate it to because I was no longer manager. I literally had to sit until 10 and 11 p.m. every other day to get the work done. And my daughter, Sammy, was, was just a little girl that time. The babysitters could sit with her only until 7 p.m. So you know what I would do? I would go all the way back home. I'd pick my girl up, bring her to my office, give her a quick meal, and then have her sleep on the office couch while I continued to number crunch with my team members. And all this hectic schedule, it was really bogging me down in my mind, in my spirit. Then one day, 
a very dear friend of mine from the HSI family, he suggested to me, he said, why don't you start your day with daily mass? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, they will be given to you. Well, at that time, the suggestion seemed really crazy. Because as it is, I was struggling for time. And this suggestion only seemed to be making a further demand of my time, isn't it? But by God's grace, I decided to obey. And I tell you, today, no matter how deadly a deadline, no matter how confusing a financial problem, somehow I make all the right connections and my work miraculously gets done by the dot of 6 p.m. I must share one thing with you. You know, there are times when my my accounts, they, they don't tally. And trying to find out where the problem is in this huge Excel sheet that has so many columns and, and so many rows, it's really literally like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But the Holy Spirit, he will take my hand and the mouse exactly to the cell that holds the problem. Yeah. And a job that could have taken me a whole day to get done, it gets done in seconds. Truly, I have tried it, tested it, and found it to be true. Seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness. And all things, they will be given to you. The second and with equal priority is for us to spend time loving others. Others here would mean our family members. You know, sadly, sometimes we are like lighthouses. We let our light shine bright to far, far lands, while our very base the people who are closest to us, our very own family, they are the ones who are deprived of our love and our light. Please, don't be like that. Spend quality time loving and cherishing your family members. And don't make it a habit compromising your time with them because of some extended hours at your workplace. Okay? Tell me, have you ever heard of a man on his deathbed cry and say, I wish I had spent more time at my office? Have you? <laughs> well, so then, you can give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but first, give to God what is God's, and Give to your family what is your family's. Regarding all the other crazy activities that would come to choke and clutter up the plan of your day and how you are expected to manage them effectively, well, there's a very professional management consultant who will take you through the training. It's a seven minute video. Pay rapt attention and may God bless you. Hello, I'm Daryl Cross and I'm an executive and personal coach. And in much of the coaching that I do, people frequently w want to know how they can find more hours in the day. How can they find more time? And my response to that is basically, they won't be able to find any more time. They have the same amount of time as we all do. It's called 168 hours in the week. And I remind them they have the same amount of time as Mother Teresa had, as Einstein had, 
as Nelson Mandela has, and so on. And so it's more a question of not so much how I can find time as what can I do with the time I already have. So it's really a matter of priorities. And I really like the work by Stephen Covey. And Stephen uh, Covey in his book, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and then in his subsequent te uh, text, uh, First Things First, uh, talked about a paradigm where he divided time into two sectors. He divided time into that which is urgent and not urgent, and he divided time into that which is important and not important. And when you do that, you can then work out a quadrant of how you can parcel time. So, for example, if I pursue that a bit further, well, what uh, Covey says that if, if time is, is really urgent and important, then the sorts of things we have in this quadrant here are crises. Um, and we would all say yes to that. There are lots of those in the workplace. Uh, we would have deadlines, um, things that have to be done by a particular time. We often have meetings and activities occurring there that are really important and that, that uh, are also have an urgency attached to them. And most of our work life um, is, seems to be in that particular quadrant where things seem to be both urgent and important. But he also says there's a, a quadrant of what he called deception, and it's quadrant three. This quadrant of deception, he says, uh, things feign being urgent, but they're really not important at all. And he says, uh, for example, there are things like interruptions. There are things like uh, emails. There are uh, things like um, some meetings and some projects. In this quadrant, he's really saying they're not really important, but they might be urgent. But they do take a good deal of our time and we get deceived. We get deceived that they are actually important and they're not really. And so it might be the phantom quadrant or it might be the quadrant of deception. We get deceived and we, much of our time gets taken up in lots of these activities that are not really critical in the way that we might presume that they are. However, he says there are some um, uh, other quadrants that we need to consider. And this one here, where it's not urgent, but it is important. In fact, Covey argues that it's vitally important. It's critically important. And in here, we have things like planning. In here, we have um, where we undertake activities where we have empowerment. Um, in here might be recreation. It's uh, being creative. It might be in here forming strategy. But it means that this is absolutely critical, but it's not urgent. It's not urgent at all. The fourth quadrant down here is the quadrant he, he suggests is the escape quadrant. And uh, there are things in here that are trivial matters. Um, it might be uh, surfing the net. Um, it might be in here that we're actually wasting time and we're actually escaping various activities that we ought to be doing. Uh, we might be um, um, just handling um, spam emails. Um, or even pursuing them. We might be just gossiping over the water cooler or the photocopier. Uh, we might even just be going out and uh, grabbing a cup of coffee and uh, reading the paper and in a sense wasting our time. And interestingly enough he argues and uh, quite rightly so that if we spend too much time in quadrant one with too many crises we often escape over here to the trivia um, and uh, in order to try to preserve our sanity. And by the way, if you spend too much time in quadrant four, uh, quite rightly, you'll probably be fired or asked to move along because over here you're not being productive at all. Now, as we look at that, uh, one of the things that I think is really uh, critical to understand here is even though we might spend most of our time in quadrant one and quadrant two, what would you consider was the most important quadrant? And most people say, oh, quadrant one, because you've really got to deal with things. Um, but if, as you look at this paradigm, 
the most important quadrant in terms of managing time is in fact this, this uh, quadrant two in here. This is absolutely critical because in here is our planning and our strategy time. And it is absolutely mandatory that we find time each day and certainly each week to put aside in our diary some planning time. That might be an hour, it might be a half an hour a day. And lots of people say to me, I can't find that time. And, and my response to that is, if you don't find that time and you spend all of your uh, time over here in quadrant one dealing with crises, then um, the good Lord or the universe or whatever you believe is going to come along and you're going to have a breakdown and you are going to be ha having forced time. And so I suggest to people that they ought to make sure that right now that they actually start to control their diaries and put in their planning time where they can actually think, time out, space to think and plan. And if they do that, if they spend more time in this particular quadrant, people end up spending less time in quadrant one and certainly less time in quadrant three. And that's what prioritizing your time is all about. Creating a time out where you can think and plan your life and get more control of your life rather than uh, life being dictated by quadrant one and three. And in the end, us escaping to quadrant four. So my challenge to you is to ask, how can you find more quadrant two time? What would it take for you to find that time? What would you do? Where would you go? Maybe you could just start with 10 minutes a day finding that quadrant two time. But ultimately, it's absolutely critical to put that into your diary because it is a road to sanity when you do that.